Hi, the Mud Broker here. This is the second of my videos on cast iron. And in my first video I showed you how to identify and gave you some tips on where you can find good cast iron cheap. I got lucky the other day. I stopped at the Goodwill and I found these two pans. I don't know if you can see the price tag very well, but they wanted $8 for each of them. Even better, blue tags were half off, so I paid $4 a piece for these. And these are a fantastic example of buying the pan before you even bother looking at the name. Because, in both cases, there's enough buildup on the back of them that I can't see any maker's name if there's one there. There are a few clues as to what these aren't. Neither pan has a ridge on the bottom of the handle which runs all the way into the side of the pan and neither pan has a heat ring with notches in it so I know it's not first a BSR Birmingham stove and range pan and because it doesn't have a notched heat ring I know neither one of these are vintage lodge beyond that I don't really know who made them but they're both nice light cast iron very good quality it's a nice smooth fine grained metal there's no cracks in them they pass the ring test but they're a little cruddy this one isn't really bad but this one has some old sticky nasty oil in it and it has a buildup of crud on the outside of the pan and on the bottom now crud on the outside of the pan doesn't really hurt anything it isn't very aesthetically pleasing but it doesn't interfere with the cooking properties of the pan but a buildup of carbon on the bottom of the pan eventually will cause problems it acts as insulation and the bottom of the pan won't heat evenly and it'll heat a lot more slowly than it should so you want to get that all off there and in any event you want to get these down to bare metal start over them and re-season them properly because you never know who did what to this pan before you got a hold of it so the two things you're going to have to deal with in used vintage iron pans is rust you can see this pan's fairly rusty and crud the first part of this video i'm going to explain several different ways of removing crud from a pan and I'm going to show you the way that I use most. In the second part I'm going to show you how to deal with rust, a couple ways of dealing with that, one of which will remove rust and crust in a single step. Now to remove burnt on built up crud from a pan you can use lye. You mix up a big plastic tub full of a strong lye solution and you dunk your pans in there. Leave it set however long it takes, a day, two or three, and the lye will dissolve all of this crud and get you down to bare metal. It's a pretty popular method, but the drawback is you're going to wind up with a big tub full of a caustic chemical solution that you have to get rid of. Another way, and this is the way that I usually do it, well, first, the second way of getting rid of the crud is if you have an electric oven with a self-cleaning cycle, you can put your pan in the oven with something underneath it to catch the crud that burns off and put it on the clean cycle. The drawback to that is this is what it'll end up like. It'll burn the crud off, but you'll end up with a fairly rusty pan that needs to be dealt with further. What I usually use is oven cleaner. Now some people object to oven cleaner. They're afraid that it'll work into the pores of the iron and you'll never get it out and you'll have oven cleaner on your pans. The truth is oven cleaner is probably 95% lye. And cast iron, while it is porous, it's not a sponge. It's not going to absorb anything to a real significant degree and the oven cleaner will wash clean. 
So, if you're going to use oven cleaner, or lye for that matter, or any cleaning technique, usually the first thing I do is try and scrape off as much of the loose crud as I can. I use a putty knife. You don't want to use something that's too stiff or too hard because you don't want to gouge the metal underneath. But just go around, give it a little scraping, and try and scrape off whatever you can get off. I'm going to do this outside so I don't make too huge of a mess out of my kitchen. And once I get some of the crud knocked off, I'll come back in and show you the next step. Alright, I'm back. A pan like this that doesn't have much buildup on it, it doesn't really pay to try scraping it. This thin stuff like this isn't going to scrape off very easily anyway, so it's kind of a waste of time. This will just go directly into the oven cleaner. This pan, I spent 8-10 minutes scraping on it, and it revealed a couple of things. First, underneath that crustiness, it's fairly rusty. That's not uncommon with pans that have a heavy buildup of crud on them, because moisture will get behind that crud, and it'll rust the iron underneath. Second, it also revealed who manufactured this pan, but I'm not going to show you that just yet. I'm going to save that for a little bit of a tease later on. This pan, I'll probably have to do something to deal with the rust beyond just the oven cleaner. Neither lye nor oven cleaner will remove rust. They're great for taking crud off, but the underlying rust, it'll have no effect on. So, i got to move my camera set up around, and we'll get these going with the oven cleaner. I'm over here at my poor old rust stained sink, and we're going to use some oven cleaner on this here frying pan. In order to do that, you will need, of course, a pair of rubber gloves, oven cleaner, whether it's a brand name or store brand, doesn't really make much difference. This was on sale cheap, so I got this. But a good heavy-duty oven cleaner works best. You'll also need a scouring pad, a stainless steel one. This is about worn out, but it'll do for this. A scraper of some sort, like the putty knife I've been using, works pretty, comes in pretty handy. And so does a little wire brush. This one's brass. Stainless steel works good, too. Either or. It's nice for getting into nooks and crannies and around lettering if there's any lettering on it. You'll also need a plastic bag big enough to put your pan in. Small pans, a large Ziploc bag works great. But for this, I will need something like a tall kitchen garbage bag. Alright. Other than that, all we need to do is spray it down thoroughly on all sides with the oven cleaner. You'll get some fumes, not a whole lot, but don't use it on hot iron. If your pan is warm, you'll get a lot more fumes, and you'll choke and gasp and cough for a bit. You don't want to do that. But, give it a good thorough spraying down, and cover all of the surfaces of your pan. careful not to show you the name on the pan, so I'll hit that first, cover it up good. <clears throat> but just work your way all the way around and get everything thoroughly coated. Once it's all covered, grab your plastic bag, and in you go. The purpose of the bag is to keep the oven cleaner from drying out. Normally at this point, normally at this point, you would let that sit overnight, but it's fairly early in the day, so I'll let that sit for four or five hours, maybe six. Then I'll clean it off and see where we're at, 
and if it needs another application we'll put some more on there and let it sit overnight. Sometimes it takes three, four, or five goings around to get this down to where you want to be but we'll see what happens once this is sat for a few hours. I sprayed both of the pans with oven cleaner and they've been sitting for about five and a half hours. I'm going to open them up and see how they're doing. Now you can see it's really liquefied a lot of that crud that was on the pan. So we'll give this a little scrubbing to get everything loose. And this will definitely need another soaking. I'll spray these down again and let them sit overnight. And you can see the crud on the inside. And we'll rinse her off. I'm not sure how well that's going to show up on camera, but it turns out that this bigger of the two pans is a marked Wagnerware pan. You'll be able to see that better once this comes all the way clean. But you can see it took a lot of the stuff off the bottom. There's still quite a bit of crud on it. Seems to have taken some of the rust off fairly well, and it's got a lot off the inside. I'm going to set this one aside. I'll give it a little better washing later before I respray it. I want to see how my other pan is doing. Again, you can see it's really liquefied a lot of that stuff. Now this pan here, <clears throat> I didn't scrape at all, but you can see it really took a lot of the, of the old crud off it. There's still some along here, and still some inside. Now I'm not seeing 
much on there for markings but this is a really nice little pan regardless but it does have a letter B get this on the camera if you can see it there right by my thumb there's a small letter B that's a mold number and Wagnerware did that on a lot of their unmarked pans so this even though there isn't it doesn't say skillet whatever size skillet it is on the bottom like that other unmarked Wagner I showed you I'm pretty sure this is an unmarked Wagnerware pan and that's a nice little pan too it's a nice thin one but anyway I'll give these a scrub spray them down again and I'll come back in the morning and we'll see what they look like then I'm not sure if I mentioned this already but between applications of oven cleaner you'll want to scrub these with soap and warm water or hot water is even better I scrape this down a little bit and dry them good you don't have to dry them on a stove but wipe them down with a towel and get them good and dry before you put your next application of oven cleaner on okay I'm gonna give this some more oven cleaner let her soak for a while and I think this will just need one more trip around well I have those two pans soaking in the oven cleaner I'm gonna move on to the next thing you're gonna to have to deal with when restoring cast iron and that is rust trying to scrub rust off a pan like this for instance can get to be a real pain it's like trying to sweep up baby powder with a broom you can get most of it but you never quite get it all and there's always a little residue left no matter what you do the two most common ways of getting rid of rust on cast iron is vinegar you can use for instance if I wanted to get the rust off the inside of this old kettle I could fill it up with warm water mix up a fairly strong vinegar solution and let it soak for a couple of days and it would remove the rust the drawback to vinegar is if you have something that has a very smooth almost polished surface to it the vinegar will etch the surface and make it a little bit rough not really rough rough but you'll lose that real fine polished sort of finish the other way to deal with rust is through a process called electrolysis electrolysis works similar to electroplating it's not really electroplating in the sense that it's not dissolving metal into a solution and using electricity to deposit it on some other item but it does reduce the rust it removes rust physically as well as changing it chemically I'll explain that a little later when I show you the actual process electrolysis also works for removing crud from a pan you can use it as a single step process to both remove rust and remove burnt on buildup. It takes longer doing it that way. What I usually do is I use both processes. I will take most of the crud off a pan using oven cleaner and then I'll throw it in the electrolysis tank, get the last any remaining crud off of it and get the rust off. So what I'm going to do is put this little pan in my electrolysis rig show you how it works this is my electrolysis tank it's a pretty simple affair all you need is a large plastic tote something for electrodes and a battery charger well it may sound a little strange using electricity to clean iron it's really a very safe process as long as you keep two things in mind first never ever use electrolysis on something on cast iron that has been chrome or nickel plated and never use stainless steel because it contains both chrome and nickel if you use this process on something that's been chrome plated or nickel plated it will produce a toxic metal solution if you ever seen the movie Aaron Brockovich the big problem in that was hexavalent chromium and that is what you'll make if you put a piece of chrome or stainless steel in this tank and run electricity through it so don't do that for your electrodes you want to use 
either cast iron or just ordinary mild steel that isn't plated. These are pieces of angle iron from an old bed frame, but you can use oh, pieces of rebar. Uh, cookie sheets work good, cheap little cookie sheets as long as they're not Teflon coated. And uh, that's all you really need is a tank, electrodes, and a battery charger. I'm going to fill this up with water and mix up the electrolyte solution and then we'll discuss battery charges a little bit more and once that's all done we'll fire it up and I'll show you how it works. I have my tank full of water that holds 18 gallons by the way. You'll have to figure out how many gallons of water your particular tank will hold. We're going to mix up the electrolyte solution. The electrolyte solution is nothing more than washing soda. Washing soda is sodium carbonate, not to be confused with baking soda which is sodium bicarbonate. They act a little differently. You'll find this in the laundry soap aisle and it costs about three or four bucks a box. You'll want to use roughly a heaping teaspoon, roughly a heaping tablespoon of washing soda per gallon of water I use a level half cup for every five gallons, so I've got roughly a cup and a half of washing soda here. Your measurements don't have to be very precise, as long as you don't go too far overboard with it, because if you get way, way too much washing soda in there, it doesn't seem to work nearly as well as a little bit less. I give this a good stir let it dissolve and I'll be back when I'm ready to set up and start running the system. My solution is all mixed up and I'm going to put the pan that I'm going to clean into the solution now. I've, I can't see my viewfinder in the sun. You want to make sure you have a decent electrical connection so you want to twist that around there. You might have to take a little bit of sandpaper and shine up a spot wherever you're going to connect your wire to the object that you're trying to clean. Into the solution we go. Make sure that it's not touching any of the electrodes or the bottom of the tank. And you should use something non-conductive for a cross piece. Even though these wires connecting the electrodes to each other are insulated, it's still just a good idea. Now we will connect up the power source, which just happens to be a battery charger. You connect the negative output of the charger to the object you're trying to clean. And it's going to give me a hard time. I'd use my tripod, but it's windy out. And every time I try and use it, it blows over. So I've got to do this one-handed. Connect the positive to your electrodes and plug in the battery charger. I'm going to set the camera down a second to do that. Nice shot of my hand. And we're off. see that, but it's starting to be getting out of my own light here, but it's starting to bubble a little bit. Those bubbles are the other thing you have to be careful with with this process. That is hydrogen gas. Just like charging a battery, this will produce hydrogen gas and at the other electrodes it'll produce oxygen. So you want to do this outside. It doesn't make a huge amount of gas but you still have to be careful because you don't really want to create your own home version of the Hindenburg disaster. And you got a dog sniffing me here so if you hear him snuffling that's what that is. Anyway, as long as you don't put nickel or chrome in this and only use iron or steel, that solution will be non-toxic. So you can dump it out wherever. It might get rusty. It'll probably get 
black and nasty if you're cleaning crud off. But that's how electrolysis works. One other thing I have to mention is the battery charger itself. There's two types of battery chargers. Automatic and manual. This is a manual charger. You must use a manual battery charger. An automatic charger senses the load that the battery is putting on the charger and it will reduce its output as the battery becomes charged. This electrolysis tank does not put enough load on a charger for an automatic charger to work. It will think the battery is fully charged and it will just shut itself off. Anyway, that's electrolysis. I'll let this sit run for six or eight hours. The warmer the solution, the faster this will work. So ideally, you would do this out on a deck on a nice hot sunny day, but it is what it is. Let that work a while, come back and check on it, and we'll see what we get. I forgot to mention, I'm going to put a link in the description of this video to a guy who does a really nice job of setting up and explaining an electrolysis tank. I kind of rushed through this a little bit just to get on with it. But he does a real nice job of showing you how to build one and how it works. By now you're probably getting sick of watching me scrub pans, so I finished these two off. This pan is completely clean. Got every little bit of the old crust and crud off it. It wasn't really heavily encrusted to begin with, but it cleaned up real good. This pan still has a little bit of stuff left on the back, but this pan isn't quite done being cleaned yet either. Now, this pan is ready to go. Almost. If you look close, you can see there's a little bit of rust to it. It's not, it's not uh, anything encrusted or anything, but it's just a little bit of a coloration to the pan. You can see it more on the back, but it's not really bad. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a trick for a pan that has just a light coating. This is mostly just kind of powdery rust that got worked into the pores a little bit. I'll show you a trick for getting rid of that. But this pan has a bit more rust to it. You can see around the inside edge here, hopefully you can see, and on this long here, that's a good bit more rusty. So I'm going to run this through the electrolysis bath before I try and season it. And before I do anything more with either one of these, I'm going to go outside and get the pan that's been in the electrolysis and see how that's doing. I've unplugged my battery charger. Always unplug the charger before you connect or disconnect the wires. Try not to drop them in the water. And let's pull this guy up and see how he looks. Oh yeah, that looks really good. I'm going to take that inside, give it a scrubbing, and see where we're at. Might need to go back in, but I don't think so. That looks like it's got pretty much all the rust off of it. We'll see how it goes. This is that little pan, the little rusty pan, that I had in the electrolysis tank. It was in there for four hours, and if you remember how rusty it was, you can see that is all gone. It's down to nice, bare, clean metal. It's a little dark. I really like the kind of results you get from electrolysis, and I really encourage you to take the chance, well, it's not really a chance, to go ahead and build yourself an electrolysis cell and use that to restore your pans. This was in, like I say, for four hours. Electrolysis works by a couple of different means. First, the bubbles will help to physically loosen any crust and crud that's on the pan, and any loose rust, and it'll just kind of flake it off. The slightly alkali solution from the calcium or uh, sodium carbonate helps to dissolve any grease and oil that's in any crud that's on there. And lastly, it chemically changes the rust. The hydrogen and electricity remove oxygen from the rust and it turns it back into either black iron oxide or 
back into iron. So you get a nice dark, clean, smooth finish with no rust on it. So what I'm going to do is take this pan, get that going in the electrolysis tank, and then I'll come back and I'll show you how to get a little bit of real fine rust off of something that's otherwise clean. Okay, this is that pan that has a little bit of rust on it we wanted to get off. Like I said, this is the equivalent of sweeping up flour. We're down to that last little bit that you just can't quite sweep up. This has been on low heat for a couple, three minutes, well more than that. Just enough that it's warmed up the sides good. We're nowhere near frying hot. You can still touch it without screaming. But the sides are good and warm. So I'm going to turn the heat off. And what you do now is you take whatever fat or oil you're going to use to season your pan. I use clarified butter. And put a gobbler in there and let it melt. Once that's all melted, take a piece of paper towel and smear it around. Get everything on the pan, wet it down good with your melted butter or oil, whatever you're using to season your pan. Get the inside, get the outside. can't really see my viewfinder because I got my light behind the camera so I'm not sure if you can even see what I'm doing but get everything oops, get everything wetted down good including the handle and we'll let that sit the burner is off and we'll let this sit for four or five minutes. This has been sitting for four or five minutes. Take a piece of dry paper towel, wipe the handle off so I can handle it, and you just wipe out the excess oil. Now what should happen is the warm oil will act as sort of a solvent. It'll help lift the rust up off of the pores of the pan. You can see some of the rust and crud that was still on there. The inside is pretty clean. Most of the rusty rust was on the outside. You can see that's a little bit there you can see that's a little bit redder. But you just give it a good rubbing down. This wasn't very bad shape. So, I think I pretty much got it in one. But if you have to, after you get all the oil wiped out, go ahead and uh, if it's still warm, melt some more butter or lard, whatever you're using, oil, and keep wiping it. See that little bit of red off the bottom? And keep wiping it until you get no more rust on your paper towel. And that's it. After this, I'll give this a wash in hot soapy water and it'll be ready to season. But I'm not going to season it just yet. That's going to be in my next video where I show you how to season pans after they've been cleaned and stripped and how to take care of them long term. I think that'll about do it for right now. So I'm going to let you go and hopefully you've enjoyed this video.